In the true story of the taming of the American Wild West, no place was more colorful than Fort Smith, Arkansas, a uniquely western town in the middle of the country. Across the frontier rode murderous gangs like the Daltons and the James Brothers, outlaws who would rob and plunder and then hide from the law in Indian Territory. To stem the tide of crime, President Grant dispatched a former congressman from Missouri to serve as federal judge for a court with total jurisdiction. No chance to appeal his stern verdicts. Desperados called Isaac C. Parker the hanging judge and the jail where he confined prisoners hell on the border. For 21 years after the Civil War, Judge Parker sent 79 felons to the gallows. Fort Smith became the capital punishment center of the universe. Our story begins on September 1st, 1896, at the close of a violent era. By act of Congress, Parker's court was stripped of its legal authority over Indian Territory, now the state of Oklahoma. A 29-year-old newspaper reporter, Ada Patterson, was assigned to interview the judge, bedridden with kidney disease. Federal courthouse. The St. Louis Republic. The scepter departed from a judicial Judah last Tuesday. With the relinquishment of Judge Isaac C. Parker's authority over the Indian Territory, that torn and bleeding Southland lost at once its best friend and its reputed foe. Congress believed it acted wisely. It is a matter of grave doubt in many minds whether the national legislature did not make a grievous mistake. The house that has been the home of this just judge and his family for the past 15 years is a large brick structure with a curiously homelike look about it. Judge, dear, mm -hmm. Miss Patterson, the reporter, is here to see you. Oh, good. Miss Patterson, have a seat, dear. Hello, Miss Patterson. Your Honor. He is the gentlest of men, How was your courtly of manner and kind of voice and face, the man who has passed the death sentence upon more criminals than has any other judge in the life. land. The features that have in them horror of the Medusa to desperados are benevolent to all other humankind. I am the most misunderstood and misrepresented of men. He was supported by pillows on a bed that has been one of pain to him for two months when he talked to me of this passing of his power that day. He toyed unconsciously with the bedspread, and his face was slight with energy. Now, we are proud of the record of the court at Fort Smith. We have been enabled to arrest the flood tide of crime here. He grew wonderfully earnest as he talked, and one could see that the ruling passion of his life held sway. His color grew deeper, and his kind blue eyes grew darker and sterner. Cruelly upset I am, but they forget the utterly hardened character of the men I deal with. They forget that in my court's jurisdiction alone, 65 marshals were murdered in the discharge of their duty. It was a gruesome array of criminals that passed before Judge Parker in a horrid phantom of more than two decades. Come this time tomorrow, there'll be blood upon my hands. Judge, prepare the gallows. Lord, I have come to meet my end. You stand convicted by the verdict of the jury. And on the day of execution, you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God, whose law you have broken, have mercy on your soul. Don't 
understand that what I say of these ruffians is directed at the Indians. 21 years experience with them has taught me that they are religiously inclined, law-abiding, authority-respecting people. The Indian race is not one of criminals. Tall cottonwood trees dotted the grounds, and as I passed under one I noticed a crooked limb, lower than the others, extending from the tallest and straightest of these. I don't know why I shivered as I noticed its shadowy, gnarled outlines. Perhaps they suggested wild stories of days of lawlessness and frontier reign of terror. It's always frustrating for uh, citizens of the five tribes to hear that narrative that this area was uh, just lawlessness. My name is Stacy Leeds and I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm a law professor at the University of Arkansas and I'm one of the former justices on the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court. The building that we're sitting in right now uh, was a judiciary that had been active for over three decades before Judge Parker ever took the bench. And so, you know, it was courts of general, general jurisdiction hearing criminal cases, civil cases. When you think of a court system, this was it. And so, you know, the, the idea that the Cherokee Nation or the other uh, of the five tribes um, had no justice, had no law, had no law and order um, is just a narrative that's not true. The territory was set apart for the Indians in 1828. The government at that time promised them protection. That promise has always been ignored. The only protection that has ever been afforded them is through the courts. Arkansas Territory, which included the present states of Arkansas and Oklahoma, was being divided as Arkansas desired to become a state within the Union. Only the eastern portion of the territory was included within the state and the western portion was to be reserved for tribes to be removed from the south and other parts of the country. Arkansans wanted Indians out of their burgeoning state. I'm Dr. Julia Coates. I'm a professor of American Indian history and I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. There is federal legislation passed called the Indian Removal Act and it is specifically targeted at what were known as the five civilized tribes in the southeast. Uh, those are the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, the Creeks, and the Seminoles. The forced removal comes to be known in Indian history and in American history as the Trail of Tears. Headquarters, Cherokee Agency, Tennessee, May 17, 1838. The Cherokees, by the advances which they have made in Christianity and civilization, are by far the most interesting tribe of Indians in the territory limits of the United States. Of the 15,000 of those people who are now to be removed, it is understood that about four-fifths are opposed or have become averse to distant immigration. The Indian Territory becomes a dumping ground where tribes from uh, across the plains in particular uh, start to be forcibly removed now uh, as settlement, western settlement, begins to pour across that region as well. I'm not sure there's another place in the United States where you could find an area, a place with that sort of a radius with Fort Smith at the center that had that many, that many different cultures in it at that time, that many different, different authorities. I'm Elliot West. I'm a specialist in the history of the American West. All of these tribes, of course, have different cultures. There's no such thing as an Indian way of life or Indian culture or Indian language. A large portion of their population uh, were slaves or sort of semi-citizens. Uh, so there, there's this large black population as well. Each of those tribes has its own government. Each has its own authority. None of them technically uh, are subject to the, to the oversight of the federal government. It's a place, in other words, where there is, there is so much authority that, you know, there's no authority. <laughs> if, you go into, if you go into Indian territory, no one's really in charge. You really can't say anyone is in charge. 
It's a jurisdictional dilemma. We have outlaws from the neighboring states oftentimes that begin to uh, commit crimes in those areas and then, then rush into the Indian Territory escaping federal pursuit. Um, the Indians are being prohibited from dealing with that by the federal government. Uh, the Indian tribes are not allowed to assert jurisdiction, uh, criminal jurisdiction over, uh, over whites. A lot of people had been wiped out by the Civil War and uh, they are coming west looking for a place to start over. Uh, there's a notion that there's free land, open land available uh, in the Indian Territory and so they are pouring in in droves. The intrusion of whites into those uh, Indian nations is so severe that the white population begins to overwhelm and outnumber the Indian population. Chaos might be a little strong, but it was quite a mess in terms, of, in terms of anyone trying to bring control to it. And that made it, of course, an ideal drawing place for people who were trying to evade authority. If you rode west out of Fort Smith, uh, you were sort of um, like Alice, you know, dropping down into a rabbit hole. You're, you're moving into a different world, a different world indeed. The place had just sort of gone feral. Conditions were made impossible by brutes or demons in human form. Their crimes were deliberately planned and fiendishly executed. Robbery was the chief incentive, and the victims were usually men with whom the murderers traveled on long, lonely rides across the plains. The, the bad guys were the white people who had moved into Indian territory, some of them legally and some of them illegally. My name is Tom Wing. I'm assistant professor of history at the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith. And uh, previous to that, I was uh, interpretive park ranger and historian for the National Park Service at uh, the Fort Smith National Historic Site. And it was a vast territory where there were plenty of places to hide, uh, and uh, it, it was lucrative to commit crime. Do not let us add another chapter to a century of dishonor by breaking up their local government. Their local governments are better than any territorial system we as a government can establish over them. What the Cherokees wanted was that the federal government made good on their promise to remove people who didn't belong there. And um, that's where the Cherokees and the other tribes would have welcomed um, federal action. But the federal action far exceeded that. In the administration of the law for the Indian Territory, Judge Parker was a necessity. The Almighty created him for a purpose. William Henry Harrison Clayton, District Attorney, Federal Court of the Western District of Arkansas. Okay, so you guys wanna see this statue first? Okay, so here we go. My name is Spencer Schubert and I'm a figurative sculptor. So today I unveiled the uh, maquette of the Judge Parker statue. So it's really an incredible honor to... And it was great to see people's reactions to the statue that I've spent the last four months working on, talking about, thinking about, which is kind of the genesis of the reason that he came to Fort Smith. I'm not creating a statue of a person. I'm creating a bronze monument of a memory of a historical figure. The judge was a tall, big man with blue eyes and a brown billy goat beard, and he seemed to me to be old, though he was only about 40 years of age at that time. His manner was grave. True Grit by Charles Portis. Judge Parker was born in Belmont County, Ohio in 1838. In 1859, he came to Missouri and engaged in the practice of law in St. Joseph. He espoused Republican principles, was a presidential elector, and assisted in casting the vote of the state for Lincoln. He's a lot like uh, what we all learned about Abraham Lincoln. He learned law, reading books at night, by candlelight himself in his log cabin. Uh, eventually he, he uh, studied uh, to the point that he could pass the bar and became a lawyer, and then that, that began his law career. In 1870, he was elected to Congress. 
Washington, D.C., March 9, 1875. U.S. Grant, President of the United States. Sir, I hereby make application for the appointment of United States District Judge for the Western District of Arkansas. My knowledge of Indian affairs attained by reason of my connections with the Indian Appropriations, while on the Committee of Appropriations, I think will give me some advantages in the way of qualifications over others who may live farther east, since the five civilized tribes of Indians came within the jurisdiction of this court. Your friend, I.C. Parker. President Grant chose Parker as the chief judicial power of Western Arkansas and the region extending to Colorado. He was the youngest judge on the federal bench. Reposing special confidence in the wisdom, uprightness, and learning of Isaac C. Parker, I have nominated and by and with the advice of the Senate to appoint him to be judge of the United States Court for the Western District of Arkansas. Given under my hand in the city of Washington, the 19th day of March, in the year of our Lord, 1875. U.S. Grant, President. And Judge Parker, you've been on the bench 21 years here. Hmm. I did not expect to stay more than a year or two when I came. The President said to me, stay a year or so and get things started. But I'm still here, as you can see. <laughs> Fort Smith, a small village on the border of the Indian Nation where gunshots and violent death were commonplace. One of the roughest and toughest towns of the Old West. So in 1875, when Judge Parker sets up court, I think everyone needs to erase from their mind the Hollywood cowboys and Indians type, type visual. So the houses and the schools and the farms that you would have seen here in Cherokee Nation uh, post-removal and certainly during the time frame of Judge Parker's term, um, it would have looked like any type of frontier town. It would have been stores, it would have been commerce, it would have been, you know, horses and buggies. The case on the docket is United States versus Shepard Busby and William Busby. The defendants are charged with the murder of Barney Connolly, the United States Deputy Marshal. Is the government ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense ready? We are, Your Honor. Mr. Clayton? Call your first witness. The government calls G.S. White to the stand. Mr. White, you're a deputy marshal and a bailiff here, aren't you? Judge Parker's life at Fort Smith has been a busy one. He has presided over what was practically a perpetual court. The sessions lasted from 8 a.m. till dark. 13,490 criminal cases have been listed on the docket. About 70% of those tried were either convicted by a jury or entered pleas of guilty. 79 had been executed, one was killed while attempting to escape, and four have died in jail. Territory has always been infested by a class of the refuse of humanity to whom I have called criminal intruders. They're refugees from justice from other states. They've perpetrated several murders and then come to the new country with a tigerish appetite for blood. Often they come from a race of criminals. And it's with their foul heredity for crime we have to contend. It's hard to imagine you know, a situation that is more primed for violence of that sort and more likely to produce people like the Daltons, uh, like the James gang. That was the world then that, um, that Isaac Parker, you know, somehow had to uh, begin to adapt to when he comes down there from Missouri in 1875. These were destitute, desperate people, and, and they didn't value life. They, they, uh, they were in it for uh, what little gain they could get. Daniel Evans is one of the first, first people uh, executed uh, under, under Parker, and, um, and he, kills, he kills a man, a, a young man, a, 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 a very young man, and uh, basically kills him for his boots. He's later found wearing the boots. People identified uh, the, the victim's boots on, on Evans at the time, and that was part of the evidence that convicted him. My first term was a portent of what was to follow. 18 murder cases came before me, 13 were convicted. One of the men I sentenced to death was a half-breed named Sam Foy. 
He had murdered and robbed a character known as a barefooted school teacher. New York Times, September 3rd, 1875. The six men hanged today at Fort Smith were sentenced at the last term of the United States court. There were eight sentenced at the time, but one was killed while attempting to escape, and the other was commuted to imprisonment for life. All the six persons were executed at the same time. All showed nerve and refused to make any confession. Here we have a federal judge. He's kind of a colorful character. Uh, he's at a, uh, on the edge of what they think of as the frontier, what they used to call the border, you know, uh, western Arkansas, western Missouri. Um, so he sort of caught the imagination of people at that time. And the fascination was always on crime and violence, and more particularly on uh, hanging. The numbers of defendants that were hung, um, the majority were um, Indian and black um, defendants, and then the minority would have been um, white settlers or, or the outlaws. Some of the Cherokees that were apprehended in the, the diaries, there's, there's comments like, you know, kill me now, but don't take me to Fort Smith. Desperado who murdered a camper and followed the murdered man's young son into the brushwood and killed him even while the little fellow was begging for mercy was one of the men who I sentenced to death. It did not appear to me to be an act of cruelty to sentence that fellow to hang by the neck until he was dead. Half of Isaac Parker's time here, uh, he was his own appellate judge in addition to the district court judge. That's giving a lot of power to one, to one person, obviously. How many times are you gonna see a judge change his mind on the appeal that he's already decided in a previous court case? Mrs. Elmo Myers, 84 years old, was born in Arkansas near Fort Smith, but most of her life has been spent in what used to be called Indian Territory. In her past are the days when she knew the man who first owned this rocking chair, the famous hanging judge, Isaac Parker. He was mean to the mean folks, but he wasn't good people, he wasn't mean to them. As a child, she played at Parker's knee and fondly recalls his kindness. He just was a nice man, that's all. Take the good ladies who carry flowers and jellies to prisoners. They mean well, but oh, what mistaken goodness. <laughs> What motives of sincerity, piety, and charity sadly misdirected. They consider alone the prisoner chained in his cell, the convict on the scaffold and his fatal plunge to death. They forget the crime he perpetrated and the family he made husbandless and fatherless by assassin's work. Well, if we had more people like Judge Parker, we wouldn't be living like we are today. I know that much. Everybody wouldn't have to be afraid and scared to death and everything else, because he'd get rid of all them kind of people. The trouble was there were non-Indians that were inside of Cherokee Nation and the other five tribes that the tribes didn't want there. But to completely extend federal jurisdiction inside of those um, governments, that was where that expansion just continued to grow in a way that was very troubling to the tribes. And the tribes objected to it early on, even before Judge Parker took the bench. Ned Christie is one of those individuals who uh, deeply resents uh, federal presence within the Cherokee Nation. Uh, he is a member of the Cherokee Senate at that time. He is a full-blood Cherokee-speaking traditionalist. On one evening after the council meetings had ended for that day, Ned Christie and a friend of his, uh, someone named John Paris, another Cherokee man, they decided to spend their evening drinking. And they started drinking and drank through the night and they passed out and slept on the banks of the creek. Unfortunately for Ned Christie that night, not far away, a murder of a federal marshal took place. And so U.S. Marshals went in pursuit of Ned Christie. For the next five years, 
there were periodic shootouts that went on between Ned Christie and, and federal law enforcement. In the final shootout, they, the federal marshals had brought in cannon and they were in the process of blasting Ned Christie's house apart. He ran out the door firing and, and shooting um, as his family members were going out the back. So he gave them escape. The building began to burn. Ned Christie ran out firing in every direction, stumbled and fell, and before he could arise, was killed by the officers. Arkansas Gazette, November 6, 1892. Part of the story is that it was actually the son of the marshal who had been killed that is allowed to come up to the body and just, you know, fire into it over and over. His body is placed on a door. Uh, it is paraded uh, through around in Fort Smith. Uh, people are able to come and look at it. The federal marshals reacted so violently, I think, toward Ned Christie because Ned Christie had been such an outspoken critic of federal intrusion into the Cherokee Nation. There was never any real evidence that, that Ned Christie had committed the murder that he was accused of. And to Cherokees then and now, he was a symbol of our, you know, national pride, right? He was gonna die here resisting that, but they had no authority to come take him. More U.S. Marshals have died in the line of duty out of the Western District of Arkansas than any other district in our nation. And so we're honored uh, to have this uh, today to recognize the contributions of these Marshals. Fort Smith is home. This is where we uh, made huge strides in justice and in bringing law and order uh, to the Old West. You know, when you want something done in law enforcement that has to do with the rule of law, the protection of justice, you call the Deputy U.S. Marshal. It takes men who are brave to uphold the law here. The officer must stand on the offensive and overcome the danger and take his man, or overcoming by violence, if necessary. We are the most hated humans and the most hunted by the bad men. There is no medical fee, nothing for disability or burial. They were just ordinary mortals who took their jobs to feed their wives and children. John Carroll, U.S. Marshal. They were tough, they had to be, they had to have a certain skill set that uh, allowed them to be able to do the work that they, they did in dangerous conditions. For more than 20 years, Guy Nichols has worked at the Fort Smith National Historic Site, which once housed the Parker Court. He's perhaps the most knowledgeable authority on the men who rode for Parker. Some of them, uh, if they hadn't been a deputy, they would probably been an outlaw because these people were rugged. It took rugged men to do the job. Uh, if you sent the most moral individual that you could find into the Indian country as a deputy marshal to try to bring out the outlaw, that man wouldn't return. Somebody would kill him. You will receive six cents a mile when on official business, 50 cents for serving papers, two dollars for an arrest, and a dollar a day expense money while chasing criminals. If you kill him, you get nothing. John Carroll, U.S. Marshal. Federal marshals that were coming into Indian Territory were recognized as having pretty extraordinary law enforcement orders. They didn't have to have a search warrant. They could just come make an arrest. They brought the, uh, the accused back to Fort Smith. They rounded up evidence. They, they, uh, they were part detective, part police officer. We take great pride today in honoring the memory of one of our bravest and most legendary deputies, Bass Reeves. He was born a slave, but died a lawman. Among the numerous marshals that have ridden for the Fort Smith and Indian Territory courts, none have met with more hairbreadth escapes or have effected more hazardous arrest than Bass Reeves, who fears nothing that moves and breathes.
B.C. Gideon, 1901. Well, I just thought it was such a wonderful, wonderful thing for the people of Fort Smith to undertake to do. My name is Paul L. Brady. I'm a retired federal judge. My great uncle was Bass Reeves, Deputy United States Marshal. I wrote the book, The Black Badge. Judge Parker did not have to appoint this black man. Bass knew the Indians since he had lived with them, and knew their language, and knew their cultures, and they, he had many friends, and they respected him. Negro deputy marshals are obnoxious in the extreme to the good people of the Indian Territory, and there is seldom one found who is fit to be appointed to such a position. Fort Smith Elevator, 1895. Now I'm sure the citizens of Fort Smith thought that something was wrong with Judge Parker to give a gun and the authority to arrest white people, and in some instances to kill if necessary. But those People on the borders who suffered so much from the uh, outlaw activity, they certainly saw this appointment as being something different because Bass was a no-nonsense type of law enforcement officer and was after uh, outlaws. My hands are bloody, they can't be forgiven alone, and I'm destined to roam. My shoes are muddy, a long walk from heaven, I'm tired and I'm restless for home. There is no doubt that there was a soft place in Parker's heart for the men who rode for him. And he truly believed that the law was meant to punish the guilty in order to protect the innocent. But even so, Bass Reeves, a black and one of his favorites with an excellent reputation, still had to face the scales of justice despite some tinge of racism in his case. Nudie Williams. I am Charles Robinson, professor of history I'm here at the University of Arkansas in Mullins Library in the Special Collections Room looking at the writings of a former professor at the University of Arkansas, Dr. Nudie Williams, and his work on African American marshals in the American West. It's important to do the work that uh, Nudie did because the voices of uh, African Americans in the American past are really, really difficult to uncover. Uh, often, you were dealing with people who were not afforded the opportunity to, uh, for, of formal educations and therefore, you know, writing was not something that was uh, universal. And so you have to really dig deep to find their stories, to hear their voices. And, th and these are important voices because they add to the character and the fullness and the reality of what American life was in the time that you're studying. This is Nudie Williams writing about Bass Reeves. Throughout his career, he insisted that he had never started a fight or drew first blood in a fight. Yet in the course of making arrests, his own belt was once cut in two by an outlaw's bullet. His hat brim was shot through, his buttons were shot off his coat, and his bridle reins were shot out of his hands while pursuing all kinds of bad men. Just another young gunslinger who doubted my ability with these six guns. He was real fast, but like a lot of them, they couldn't shoot both fast and straight. Fast Reeves. Judge, prepare the gallows. Lord, I have come to meet my end. There was to be a triple hanging at the federal courthouse in Fort Smith, and people from as far away as East Texas and North Louisiana were going to see it. It was like an excursion trip. True Grit by Charles Portis. If you knew that there'd be an execution in two weeks, a story goes that you could uh, ride in from your farm, 
make a weekend out of it, do your shopping, see your family, and for whatever uh, morbid or sensational relationship that you had with the spectacle of the execution, it was certainly probably uh, something to witness. And it achieved a carnival-like atmosphere. Um, people would, uh, you know, concessions might even be sold and, and uh, pictures would be made and, and, and things uh, of, of that nature. Parker, uh, in his position, didn't like that. So he ordered an enclosure built. Excuse me, I'm looking for John Armstrong. I'm John Armstrong. The past year contributed a goodly quota to the gruesome category, swelling the list of executions that have taken place on the old gallows at Fort Smith to nearly 100. Where, I asked a little nervously, where are the gallows? The guard pointed to 100 yards from where we were sitting. You don't want to see them, though, I mean. I would, if you wouldn't mind. Well, if that's what you want. Well, thank you. Yes. It followed along the narrow pathway, wide enough for about one, that led from the jail to the gallows. It is a well-defined path. It has been trodden too often. In the gathering shadows, it looked not unlike the shed of summer kitchens. It was whitewashed and had a sloping roof. That was all I could see. The old frame, which had so faithfully done its grisly work for 20 years, was not calculated to cure a case of nerves or to promote sleep. Well, that's what she came to see. Yes, thank you. Weather beaten, except as to the stout new beam, the heavy scaffold rose to a height of 20 feet in the front, and at the rear the roof sloped to half that distance from the ground. The stone wall against which the gallows rested strayed into the presence of death. A low bench stood at the rear of the scaffold, and here the condemned men sat while the death warrant was being read. While we were climbing, the guard said, be careful, the trap is open. The trap extended across the door its entire length of 18 feet. Why is the trap so large? Because we can swing as many as five at a time. The way it works is before the men come out, they lift up the door. They step out on it, the hangman drops the lever, and the rest is the undertaker's. Now, it's all supposed to be private, but about 50 fellers sneak in here and they want to see the performance. I'll tell you something, though, about every hanging I ever saw. Every man says they're innocent, no matter what's been proven against them, even with the noose around their neck. The hangman was a thin bearded man named George Maladin. He was wearing two long pistols. He was a Yankee. True Grit by Charles Portis. George Maladin, old man Maladin as he is known in Fort Smith, has hanged more than 80 men. Maladin was appointed hangman at about the same time that Judge Parker laid his strong young hands upon the judicial reins of the wild border country. And his was the last face that many a red-handed murderer saw before he opened his eyes upon the mysteries that are said to await us in a world beyond earthly vision. George, you hung a lot of men. Any of them ever come back to haunt you? No ghost have ever haunted me. I reckon I hang them too. I see you have your basket of rope. A big knot is a secret of a good execution. The humane way to hang a man is to break his neck, not strangle him to death. If you strangle a man, it isn't a pretty sight. He kicks and twists a lot. If you break his neck, it's a painless death and instantaneous, not even a quiver. He just sways and twirls a little. As an older gentleman, he traveled around the country showing ropes that supposedly were used in different hangings of different outlaws. He billed himself as the executioner. This is not fiction, and I did not make the characters which the book reveals. I present to you a history of events as they occurred without fixing over. It is truth, and if at times it is even stranger than fiction, then is a well-known proverb proven. Samuel W. Harmon. 
One of the biggest sources of mythology, I think, related to the federal courts is a book that's probably been around the longest, and that is Hell on the Border. Hell on the Border by Samuel Harmon, it is the genesis account of the federal court. Uh, it lays out many of the stories that are, that are told, that got picked up popularly. Is it biased and, and ideologically driven? Yes. yes. <laughs> Is it, but it, can it tell us something important about that time, exactly. how people were thinking about it? Absolutely. I regard myself as a woman who has seen much in life. Bell Star, Fort Smith, 1888. The official newspaper files of the early West record many stories of famous and notorious characters of that period. Among them, born in 1848, Bell Star, horse thief and harborer of criminals, lived hard and fast enough to become known in her day as Queen of the Bandits and to go down in history as America's most notorious woman outlaw. A few years ago, a little lady came in and the first thing she told me was that she had seen Bell Star many times. Well, I asked her, was Bell Star really a beautiful woman? And she said, Bell Star was as homely as a mud fence. So then I asked her, how come all these stories that Bell's a beautiful woman? She said, according to the same stories, Bell was the only woman that went into the saloons and drank with the men in the 1870s and 80s. She punched me in the ribs with her bony little elbow and said, son, let's face it, even today, one woman in a saloon full of drunk men. Naturally, she's a beautiful woman. It's a back and forth and back and forth. And the detail is only important insofar as it moves my vision for the whole sculpture forward. I have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours staring at, reading about, thinking about, um, making attempts at a likeness of uh, Isaac Parker. So uh, there is an intimacy between my idea of him and my idea of myself. And so the Judge Parker that I'm trying to represent here is um, not the young Judge Parker who has just arrived at the frontier and not the old Judge Parker who you know, basically held court almost up to the end of his ability to stand. But it's a combination of those two where he knows the score, he understands what he's doing, but he still has a youthful vitality. I am refining the expression, capturing the nuance of the expression that I want the statue to have. I am refining the fine details of the clothing. The major movements have passed. Right now I'm working on details that are going to tell the story. So the pin's really interesting, and you know, it may be apocryphal, but the story is, is that his wife had a pair of earrings early on in their wedding, and um, they were these small little lizard earrings, and she lost one, and so she had the other made into a brooch. I've noticed you have an interesting stick pin on your nightstand. Is that a lizard? Yes, it is. This is quite a treasure. My wife Mary gave me this as a wedding gift. I often wear it on my lapel when I'm sitting on the bench. Huh. Gentlemen, you are called upon this day to make a most serious judgment involving one of the most heinous crimes that can be committed. If you find this man guilty, then he should be declared as such. If you believe the argument of the defense, then a verdict should be returned of not guilty. I think Parker was one of the greatest judges we've ever had. In fact, I think he was one of those people that could not be bribed. He couldn't be forced into something with political pressure. I have a motto for my court. No politics shall enter here. Dan, you know I've talked before, and, and you have some pretty, pretty strong feelings about Judge Isaac C. Parker. He progressively doubles down on his powers at the court. And uh, from 1875 to 1890, um, the president was the only one that a, that a death sentence could be appealed to. And so from, from 90 to 96, as the Supreme Court could hear death sentences, uh, appeal death sentences, 
uh, I believe it was 44 cases were heard and 31 were overturned. Right. That's 70 percent of the cases uh, that Supreme Court uh, revisited getting overturned. One of the biggest rebuttals uh, to his court was that they said he was leading the juries mm -hmm. and his response to that uh, was that he said it's okay that I'm leading the juries because I'm leading them to justice. So that, that statement, I think, um, reveals the fact that he had become a megalomaniac. I think in some ways what he said was, was right. He was, he was so opposed to the appeals process. And he didn't like the Supreme Court stepping in. And he felt like the Supreme Court was looking at one small piece of the case when, when he and the jury have heard all the testimony and seen all the evidence and made a decision based on the big picture. He didn't like the direction the court system was going at all, and he resisted that to the bitter end. He was offered two other positions. He was offered a, 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 a judge position in Little Rock and one in St. Louis, and he turned them down. And, and part of his explanation for turning them down was he did not think anyone else could govern Indian Territory the way that he could. Well guys, well, welcome to our courtroom. In many ways, this is kind of the high point to our story. You think about Judge Parker, what do we call Judge Parker, the what judge? The hanging judge, right? People talk about him being the guy who wanted to hang everybody. If you watch the movies and stuff, they'll even, I think, uh, the movie um, Hang Him High, it has him, you know, the judge doing a thumbs up, thumbs down thing like he's the, like a Roman Caesar. That's all movie stuff. In real life, believe it or not, Judge Parker was against the death penalty. He thought it was morally wrong. I kind of sympathize with the place that he was in intellectually. I've sat as a, a judge on a court, and when you're enforcing the law, you're not the person who wrote the law, you're the person there to interpret it. Parker is, uh, is ill. The court is winding down as far as a jurisdiction standpoint. Uh, Indian Territory is on the edge of becoming the state of Oklahoma. That's going to happen a few years later. So times were changing. This feeling inside me is reaching its peak. But fame and misfortune is not what I seek. They've called me a heartless man and a bloodthirsty man. But no one has pointed to a specific case of undue severity. Have you noticed what a metamorphosis a man undergoes when he is talking of that which has more absorbing interest than anything else in life? Do equal and exact justice is my motto. I'm too tired to talk more now. Oh, Mary, I'm fine. <laughs> but he had more to say, and his eager interest gave him an artificial strength. I believe in the abolition of capital punishment provided there is a certainty of punishment, whatever that punishment may be. The trouble is with the bench and behind it a model in sentimentality that forgets and condones a crime upon which the blood stains have dried. The sick man was pale and exhausted when the earnest recital came to an end. When I bade him goodbye, the judge whose warm heart is controlled by his keen mental vision and unerring sense of justice said, don't think me too much of a pessimist. I believe better times are coming. I brought you a Sunday edition of the St. Louis Republic for you to look oh, through. Oh, well, thank you, Miss Patterson. Mary and I will enjoy reading that. <laughs> it was an honor. It was a pleasure, Miss Patterson. Mary, Miss Patterson's ready to leave now. I am glad I have the honor of knowing this alleged cruel judge. The press and people view him through the glass of distance. But in my view, he is a 20th century hero, worthy the fame of the most just of Romans. More than all, he is a good man. Ada Patterson, The Sunday Republic, St. Louis, Missouri, September the 6th, 1896. On his deathbed, he asked for a priest and became a Catholic. That was his wife's religion. It was his own business and none of mine. If you had sentenced 160 men to death and seen around 80 of them swing, then maybe at the last minute you would feel the need of some stronger medicine than the Methodists could make. True Grit by Charles Portis.
November 18th, 1896, The New York Times. Isaac Parker, judge of the United States Court for the Western District of Arkansas, died yesterday at Fort Smith from a complication of diseases. He had been located at Fort Smith and had probably passed a death sentence on more men than any other judge in the United States. Our beloved judge has fallen asleep. He will meet us and greet us no more in his accustomed place. He stayed not for partings and farewells. When we think of his bereft family, we long to speak words of sympathy as we stand with them in the shadow of great affliction. J. Warren Reed, defense attorney. Judge Parker's remains were interred in the National Cemetery in a spot selected by himself several years ago. There were thousands in attendance, and the funeral was the largest ever held in this city. General Pleasant Porter of Eufaula Creek Nation placed upon Judge Parker's grave an offering of wild flowers. Fort Smith Elevator, November 20th, 1896. There was never another court ordered hanging at the gallows. Not long after Parker's burial, the whitewashed execution scaffold was burned down by order of the town's mayor. Decades later, the gallows were rebuilt as a tourist attraction in what is now a national historic site. I think if you go to Fort Smith today, you can see the Western elements that really made it a frontier town. Portis refers to the, the wide street of Garrison Avenue, which is still really wide. Uh, so the, that idea of Fort Smith as an, an access point to the wilder West, as, as the, the beginning of the frontier and the end of the United States, makes it uniquely situated to tell uh, the story of American westward expansion. Yeah, lift them up, set the pins, set them down our reference points, park the pins, drill the holes on the concrete that we can come back to. The Judge Parker I want to have existed is a person who was of his time, but aware of the world and the wrongs and the rights and his place in them. So we're gonna get him two inches down and then we're gonna measure. That was a very tumultuous time in our nation's history. And we are clearly still grappling with the things that happened before, during, and after the, the time in our country in which Judge Parker gave his service. All right. The going to the frontier and basically working himself to death in service of making the West a safe place so that people who wanted to just come exist and produce and grow and live and die and build this nation could do so with a feeling of security. The stories that our history is full of are so interesting to dive into and learn about. Every single human being is full of layers and nuance and I think respecting that 
and learning about that will lead us into the future. So thank you again. We appreciate it. Gateway Park will be a welcome and a treasured addition to downtown Fort Smith. And we now have Fort Smith downtown bookend by two, by two of the greatest monuments in the state, Bass Reeves on the western end, and now this facility. What a great place we are today. And I want to also remind you that we are not here to celebrate the hanging judge. We're here to celebrate Isaac Parker, the community citizen. He was a individual who was instrumental in helping establish the public schools in Fort Smith, establishing health care in Fort Smith, starting a bank in Fort Smith. In fact, he gave the very first commencement speech at the Black High School when it was established in Fort Smith. So he was much more than a frontier judge. Well, it was a wonderful tribute to him by the city of Fort Smith. And it's a beautiful park and uh, for all to see. Anyone that comes to Fort Smith would be very impressed. Why is it that we are so mesmerized by these stories around him? Wasn't it just part of the federal court system? I think it was more than that. People want to find more than that in it. They want to read more. They want to see something about the time. By looking at Isaac Parker and trying to, uh, and, and then thinking about trying to live their way, to imagine their way back into that period. That's to me, is what's most interesting about it. I have often said to the grand jury, permit no innocent man to be punished, but let no guilty man escape. Judge Isaac C. Parker. With your blood,